I came to the garden and I realized that one tomato has been eaten. Ah! One tomato. <laughs> Just one. I don't know. I don't what kind know. of a horror story? You, you've never told scary stories in your life? Did you not go to camp? How did you learn how to make s'mores? Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. So we are here in our garden at night, and this is uh, a new thing. We haven't shown you our garden at night, which makes sense. You can't see very much at night. Not a lot happens here during the night, or so you would think. But nighttime is when they come. Dun, dun, dun. Tell them who them is. Who is the, who are they? The ba the bet the. <laughs> Do you remember what we're talking about? The the rude guests. You know, we don't like to call them pests because, yeah, that's like kind of reductive. Instead, they're just guests who are a little rude because they take a little bit too much. We don't mind sharing, but like leave some for us. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what we call rude guests, actually, it's just a part of the biodiversity. So we find like uh, sharing with uh, all the life around as long as it's regulated. So anyway, it's late, we gotta go to bed, uh, but we're gonna check in with you later and we'll get to talking about all those fun, weird, uninvited, rude guests. So today we are here in our garden to talk about bugs. Bugs are the first kind of uh, rude, uninvited guest that comes to our garden. Uh, we love bugs, bugs are amazing, but some of them take more than they should. And that's not cool. Uh, so don't do that, bugs. Stop it. Knock it off. Knock it off. Knock it off. For sure, not all the bugs are harmful. Most of them are very helpful in the garden. And some are harmful for the plants when the population become too big that it's uh, just uncontrollable. What we want to do is just to reduce their population. We're actually a no-kill garden. We do not kill anything on purpose. On accident, we probably kill a lot of little bugs. It's hard, we're big and they're small, and sometimes you don't see them and you step and it's a whole thing. Anyway, uh, we don't kill them on purpose. However, sometimes we outsource their killing. It's not that we hire hitmen to kill our bugs. Uh, however, our number one strategy that we have here in the garden to control our bug population is attracting their predators. So for example, aphids. Aphids, probably like a number one pest for a lot of gardeners. Uh, and many gardeners, yeah, many gardeners would just spray chemicals on their, on their plants in order to kill those aphids. We're not gonna do that. We're doing permaculture approach. So our first question is who eats aphids? And the answer is ladybug larva. So if you can get ladybugs in your garden, you are guaranteed that you will have lots of little ladybug larvae eating those aphids whenever they pop up. How do you get ladybugs to your garden? You plant plants that ladybugs love. For example, in our biodiversity zone, we've planted yarrow, we've planted chives, we've planted cilantro, we've planted marigold, we've planted dill. All of these plants that are guaranteed to bring ladybugs to our garden. Oh, it's not just uh, ladybugs, but it's many other uh, insects as uh, lacewings or even some lizards and uh, frogs and those all are named beneficials because they help the garden. It's a lot of thing for a beginner like us to know, to understand how you're gonna attract them all. And that's great about this training made by permaculture design. It's they create that template and they mix all those flowers. They're gonna attract all those beneficials. They even install some niches for them and some uh, spots for them also to drink water just to attract them. And it works very well so far. What the permaculture says is the system, when you create an ecosystem, the ecosystem is going to take care of that. Uh, and that's what's fantastic about it. As one of the founders of permaculture said, we don't have a problem of slugs, we have a lack of ducks. That's really profound. Thank you. We all just have a lack of ducks. So, our second rude guest, we're going to talk about it today, slugs. Evil slugs. No, they're not evil slugs. They're actually good for the garden because they provide a lot of uh, uh, services. When slugs eat, they don't digest the spore, but they activate them. So they help to propagate the mycelium and good fungi. Also, their mucus is rich in nitrogen and they transform 
also the mulch and the food into compost, into fertility. The problem is they just eat everything. So what happened is I come, I plant a row of uh, spinach and as soon as they sprout, maybe like a week after they sprout, they start to disappear one by one and they disappear fast. And to be honest with you guys, I have been tempted more than once to use those tiny granules that are organic and would just kill them. But I don't want to enter that mindset. I want to try to find different solution for that. To talk of, about the best, best solution about slugs, it's ducks. But we can't have ducks here, so we're trying other stuff. For the rest of this video, I'm gonna switch, <laughs> switch my position because it's very painful. <laughs> Magic! So the solution that I started to try uh, last uh, winter, it's those domes. Basically, those domes are made of chicken wire and they covered with this thermal cloth that let the air and the water go through. Uh, but the insects can't go through. And the chicken wire itself uh, doesn't let the rat as well go through. So uh, it's a double protection. So what I do is I twist the dome in ground, like maybe it goes one inch in ground, to make sure that the slugs won't go like under the dome. And when I remove the dome, the plant is tall enough to not suffer the damage of some slugs eating it. So we may lose some leaves, but it's not an issue anymore. It worked pretty well last year when I did it with the spinach. I tried again, and so uh, we're going to discover that together and I'm gonna lift some domes for you guys to see. I think this one is great, so... Yeah, this one is great. Seed it directly in ground without transplant. Boom! This is happy. Now I'm gonna show you the, the, the test with the plastic one. This is bottles of water or juice that I recycled from I don't know where. I cut the bottom, cut the top, I put the uh, thermal cloth and so it's breathing and the water passed through here. There's also tiny holes on the side here for breathing. And I see it there and we can see the seedlings growing and not being attacked. So that's great. So for this segment, I'm gonna talk a little bit about rats. Uh, rats have been a real tough problem for us over the last couple of years. They're really cute. I love the movie Ratatouille. However, rats in reality are a pain in the tuchus. Not only will they eat like the produce that we grow, like the tomatoes, but they'll actually uh, chew the stems of some of our plants, thereby killing the rest of the plant. Our strategy around rats uh, so far has mostly been about keeping them off of our specific plants or specific planting areas. If you watched our wicking bed episode, we actually built a physical cage around our wicking beds to keep the rats off of them. That has worked super well. The unfortunate thing about that solution is we can't really replicate it everywhere because our beds are really big. There's a lot of space we have to cover. So what is the long-term solution? What's the long-term permaculture solution to rats? Well, there's a little clue and it's right over my shoulder and it's that bad boy right there. Am I pointing at it? Is the camera, does it look like I'm pointing? Am I, oh, I nailed it, yeah. That is called an owl box. And the reason we have an owl box in our garden is because we are hoping to attract an owl. Remember earlier when we were talking about how a lot of permaculture is about attracting natural predators to the animals that we want to control? Uh, well, that means for rats, it's owls. <laughs> Not that kind of owl, because Fun fact, rats are super smart. They know that that's a fake owl. <laughs> They're not gonna fall for it. We need a real live owl that is capable of eating 3,000 rats in a single nesting season. That's right, a pair of nesting owls can eat 3,000 rodents in one season. Uh, if that's exciting to you, check out our owl video to learn more when we interviewed <laughs> Hungry Owl Project about <laughs> owl boxes and how to control rat populations. So we're gonna do a whole episode about how we erected our owl box next season, and hopefully by then we will have an owl. But just as a sneak preview, we've got this incredible owl box up here with a super hilarious punny uh, logo we put on the side that says permaculture is a hoot, and it's great, and I stand by it. <laughs> Welcome again for the fourth part of this episode. Raccoons. Raccoons. <laughs> this biodiversity zone does a great job at uh, attracting biodiversity, but it has its limitation when it's about the big animals such as raccoons, because uh, this biodiversity zone not gonna attract 
the mountain lion. If we're attracting mountain lions, we are doing something very wrong. <laughs> we had a raccoon problem last season, particularly, where we had one or two raccoons that would come to our garden at night right after we had like planted a bunch of seeds and there was a bunch of bare soil where things were gonna sprout. And the raccoons came in and they were like, awesome, I'm gonna go dig for bugs. And they would literally undo all of our work in a single evening. And we started getting all of the different solutions, the no-kill solutions that exist out there. Uh, and there are some wild ones. One of the solutions we came across was to collect mountain lion urine, that that was maybe a way to <laughs> distract raccoons. Another way is to just figure out where they come from and to make sure it's well clothed. But there's so many entry points here. Also, they climb trees. They're very good climber. Another solution that we heard uh, might work was spreading uh, pepper in our garden. Not only did it not dissuade them, I think it made the worms taste better. We also tried the motion activated light, but uh, I think they just enjoy it because now they see better what they're gonna eat. After we had exhausted all of these options, other than going to the Oakland Zoo and getting mountain lion urine, <laughs> this was our penultimate option. That's when we introduced to you the Yard Enforcer. So this guy is honestly incredible. It is a randomized motion and heat activated sprinkler system. That's it. That's all it is. But it works so well because unlike the lights, which don't pose any threat to these raccoons, the spray of water freaks them out. It becomes an unwelcoming uh, space. And that's it. It doesn't hurt them at all. When we installed it, we got it on camera. You can see the raccoon coming and get sprinkled. It just got freaked out and ran away. It came again the next night and it got sprinkled again and it freaked out again and it left again. And guess what? It came again the third night. And what happened? Sprinkled and left. And never since the raccoon came back. That was great. That was a really riveting story. I like Ooh. the way you told it. So we're not being paid to promote this product, but uh, if you uh, have a raccoon problem, the Yard Enforcer, it's like 80 or 90 bucks. It's money well spent. You can spray all of your little animals and watch them run. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but it is very, it's kind of fun to see them after the terror they've like wreaked on our garden to see them and run away. Yeah. But sometimes it's just fun to watch a raccoon get nailed by a sprinkler. <laughs> Well, we're gonna get out of our creepy garden because it's nighttime and it's creepy and I'm actually scared. So <laughs> I don't like the dark. The... <laughs> Rude. <laughs>